America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, we celebrate our 50th episode with a reunion of five former national security advisors. These former Battlegrounds guests, known as the Quint, are Ambassador Mark Sedwell from the UK, Ambassador Mariangela Zappia from Italy, Ambassador Christoph Hoiskin from Germany, Ambassador Philippe Etienne from France, and our host, H.R. McMaster. In 2017 through 2018, all five worked closely together as an informal consultative body and subset of the Transatlantic Alliance. They sought to advance and protect mutual interests through the application of each nation's competitive advantage in complementary and synergistic ways. Today, our host and guests will reflect on their experiences together and share perspectives on contemporary challenges to security and prosperity, from Russia's war on Ukraine to the policies and actions of the Chinese Communist Party, transnational terrorism and migration, and energy and food security. Friends, Mariangela Zapia, Christoph Hoiskin, Philippe Etienne, Mark Sedwell, welcome to Battlegrounds. It is great to be reunited with, uh, you know, with the Quint Club of National Security Advisors uh, after five years. Great to see you. Wonderful to see you. Great to see you, HR, and, uh, and all of our friends. Nice to see all of you. Nice to see all of you. Hey, I, it, you know, I've been reminiscing about our time together, you know, how we worked together on major challenges to our mutual interests. You know, I, I kind of feel good about what we're able to accomplish together, but of course, the world has changed you know, uh, in, in five years, and, and probably not for the better, I think we'd all agree. We're all facing very significant challenges, and I remember how we, you know, we resolved to, you know, to, to work together to understand how we could apply our competitive advantages across each of our nations in a synergistic and, and complementary way. And so what I'd like to do is just open up the conversation with your view on the importance for multinational cooperation to, to cope with the challenges we're facing uh, and to take advantage of opportunities and, and what you think kind of are the essential ingredient, ingredients you know, for, you know, for fostering multinational cooperation and, and maybe you know, reminisce a little bit about our, our time together and, and how we work together. We should maybe ask the one who's still serving as an ambassador to, uh, to kick us off. <laughs> Thank you very much, and, and uh, well, I'm also the only woman, which, uh, which doesn't give me a, a right to speak first, but since uh, I'm different here. <laughs> but uh, first of all, thank you so much, HR, for bringing us together again. Uh, and indeed, as you were saying, um, it was a quite special cooperation that we had at the time, uh, not long time ago, by the way. Um, this idea of working constantly together to understand our competitive advantage as a group uh, in, in trying to uh, analyze um, crisis uh, and challenges. And I, maybe I want to start really from that uh, and the role of the Quint. I, I really see it as a sort of steering wheel. Uh, it's, it's really the place where um, some of the uh, different perspectives um, given by you know, our geographical position, our, our experience, our history comes from, um, really can serve uh, to understand and uh, to analyze and to understand better where and how our action can be more efficient. So I really believe in the format. I think that what we did together, uh, these uh, analyzing challenge by challenge and try to have a common line was, was really uh, very important. And I have to say, um, 
looking at what's happening now, and particularly uh, the war in Ukraine, the brutal aggression of Russia, I think the Quint served uh, as really the steering wheel or, or the steering committee, if you want, that then translated in the G7. And also the G7 has um, acquired, I think, um, a very important role. So Quint, G7, hopefully, uh, transmitting all these in the G20 and creating uh, that environment that ca can help um, addressing challenges together also with uh, what we consider the rest, right? And I don't like at all the expression, the West and the rest. Uh, I don't like either the Global South uh, expression, but this is the reality. The, the world is much bigger than us, um, but we can have a role in, in really uh, shaping uh, our own understanding of facts. I think what struck me, HR, and Maringa, I agree with everything you've just said, is how well we all work together and our, and our colleagues, but we have to recognise that uh, we, we were not operating in a period of real um, Western, I, I agree with Maringa is a bad word, but no one's come up with a better one, uh, of real Western unity. We had, we had considerable frictions, transatlantic frictions, of course, within Europe. We were wrestling with the Brexit negotiations for much of that time. And I think perhaps we lost sight, not the five of us, but I think our, I think our nations uh, lost sight of the fact that uh, the rest of the world was moving on. And if we want to really influence um, the course of global security, then we have to be completely united. Uh, and put aside whatever squabbles there might be among ourselves in order to do that. Because if we are preoccupied with arguing among ourselves, with you know, um, imposing tariffs on each other and, and, uh, and so on, then um, the rest of the world will just move, um, uh, move ahead uh, without us. And we're seeing just this week with uh, the visit of President Xi Jinping to Moscow, his first visit just after being re-elected for a third, re-elected, reappointed, um, re-something for a third term and putting together a, a, a government of protégés, we've seen that others will seek to fill the vacuum. I think Maringa is also absolutely right that we haven't um, in the past few years done enough collectively, whether it's the, the five uh, countries, the G7, etc., to really engage with not only the global south, I agree with Maringa that, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's sometimes a slightly awkward term, but those many countries in Latin America, Africa, the Gulf, um, Asia, who are rediscovering the attractions of non-alignment. And, uh, uh, and we need to do more, our countries need to do more to engage with them, listen to their point of view, and therefore hopefully persuade them um, that, that uh, our point of view is still, uh, uh, is still the one that will preserve global order and uh, uh, the global economy and, and global security. I, I wanted to say, uh, answering your question, HR, that uh, one a very important factor in our cooperation, especially in the context which Mark has uh, recalled, which was a context where our countries did not uh, agree on everything and had some, uh, some uh, difficult uh, issues to solve among ourselves. Uh, was a personal relation between uh, between the our in, inside our group, between our people, but more generally between our administrations. This has struck me, and this is the reason why I am so happy to, to see all of you this morning, uh, because it matters a lot, finally, the human factor. Uh, number two, um, at that time, I remember, of course, the issues were not the same, but I remember, uh, especially with you, HR, we, we had still on the top of the agenda uh, and I think it is still around the importance of the fight against the terrorist threat. And we live in a time where we have an accumulation of crises and not, not one crisis solved and others are appearing. And of course, uh, now we are all on the, the, this uh, aggression, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, but we have all the other um, uh, issues which are still on, on, on our plate. And you mentioned Syria, one of the most uh, 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 important uh, things I, I remember when we had to tackle the uh, 
chemical uh, uh, arsenal of Assad supported by Russia already. And coming back to the fight against terrorism, I was really um, happy this morning to, to, to hear about the release of two, one American, one French hostage in Sahel, uh, which shows how important this uh, cooperation remains uh, among our, uh, our countries, among our democracies. Last point, uh, coming back to what Mariangela and, and Mark said, uh, neither I like the expression of a uh, global south, but I think uh, it's more than ever, of course, facing the, the war in Ukraine, uh, a priority uh, to address the other challenges, which are global challenges or more specific challenges of those countries. As a group, uh, of course, we have the G7 for this, and uh, it was uh, underlined by the colleagues, but also uh, to cooperate inside the United Nations system, inside the international financial institutions, inside the G20, to tackle the issues which are really pressing for those countries, especially the issue, the financing issue, and the adaptation of our financing instruments, including the development banks, to the needs of those countries, which otherwise have the impression that we ask uh, them to, to be on our side, uh, but uh, which uh, prefer, of course, to remain uh, neutral when Russia invades Ukraine. Maybe I can come in there and I want to end uh, exactly where Philip just ended, but let me first, uh, HR, also recall with a lot of nostalgia the, the time we were in office and we were actually strategizing together um, division of labor and how we agree on certain um, policy issues. I think that's something I hope that our successors um, do today. Um, I wanted to make two uh, remarks. The first one is indeed of um, you know having our leaders work together, um, the G7 or beyond. Um, as you know, we I chair the Munich Security Conference now, and we were very happy to have actually um, um, Prime Minister Sunak, President Macron, Vice President Harris, uh, Chancellor Scholz, and we we had hoped to have Prime Minister Meloni there, but then the President Meloni, but in the end we had Tajani, who was also very good. So we had the the, the quint in in in, in Munich. Um, but what I did this year is um, in advance of our discussion also to say, well, it's good that we get along with the other and we have to do, we have to be united, totally agree, but we just have to pay much more attention to um, Africa, Latin America and Asia. And we have missed this. Um, I was ambassador at the UN and was, uh, so was Mariangela and we, um, we saw how much um, China has um, on many issues um, the Africans lined up behind them. Uh, they, they, I think, personally like us much more, but they get the money, the investments by China and China conditions there, and they are very brutal there. So we have to pay much more attention to the global south. It's not enough to do, you know, one-off exercises to do a summit or to do a trip. No, we have to do it on a much more regular basis. I think we have to. Um, Put more people into our missions or we have to um, um, empower the eu missions but um, usually in in third in countries in in africa we have like two or three german diplomats and then we have 100 chinese and uh, um, they they are all over the place so we have to um, we have to work together there we must not have any illusions about russia and china um, uh, China loves the situation where Russia is in now. They're their junior partner. Um, HR, you remember McCain, he said years ago that um, um, one day Russia will become China's gas station. And that's exactly where they are right now. I think the Chinese are benefiting from the fact that um, Russia has cut itself off the West and they are benefiting now from cheap gas and oil and um, um, so on the other hand of course she has an interest in keeping um, in keeping Putin in power because the worst that could happen to she is to have another 
um, you know, Perestroika or have another Gorbachev have uh, uh, Russia turn democratic, which right now is uh, we cannot imagine, but you never know. And um, the Chinese look at the long haul. So don't expect from China to be a neutral moderator, but they will always support um, uh, Russia as their junior partner. And they are together in spreading this narrative that this war is, you know, continuation of East-West and we are East-West competition. We are, um, you know, we are accused of double standards. Where were you 20 years ago when the US invaded Iraq, which was also against international law. Now you ask us to take sides, but we are affected by, um, you know, financial crisis, but, um, uh, but also energy, food crisis, and uh, this is our concern. You get it over with, and we don't care how, but get it over with so um, that um, um, you know, our, our concerns are alleviated. So, and therefore, to make my point, I got you know, I put the global south, so to speak, um, I don't use this expression, but between friends, um, on the main stage uh, in Munich, on the main date, uh, but I was surprised how Prime Minister of Namibia, Vice President of, uh, of Colombia, Foreign Minister of Brazil, who we know, um, Maria Angela, Mauro, and how much they're equidistant, you know, and um, so there we have to do, be much more active and um, on eye level and also cater to their concerns, as um, Philip just said, on, on financing, but food security and other issues. So we need to pay much more attention to um, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Back to you, HR. Well, I think this is just a really important area for cooperation across the Quint, the G7, as you mentioned, because it's a vast problem. But you know, I'm I'm feeling kind of optimistic. I mean, Christoph, I was not there in Munich this year, but I I feel as if countries can help over time if we work together to realize that we're not asking them to choose between you know, between Beijing or Moscow and you know and uh, and Berlin, you know, or or Rome or or Paris or London or Washington. I think increasingly we can help them come to the conclusion that it's really fundamentally a choice between sovereignty and servitude. When you look especially at what Russia is doing in West Africa, uh, China's use of you know predatory loans and and creating creation of servile economic relationships, how all of them really love working with corrupt governments, you know, to to advance uh, advance their interests. So I, I, have, I have I'm optimistic about it, but you're absolutely right. We do have to work completely together on this and and kind of divide the labor because in all of our countries, I think our citizens are are skeptical uh, about about sustained engagements in, in other parts of the world and, and the resources uh, applied for, for development assistance and, and the new model for financial um, financial assistance and loans and and economic development that Mariangela uh, no, um, you know, noted at the outset, I think is really critical. But what I'd like to do is because, you know, of course, our time is so limited, there's so much to talk about, is to talk about really what we, we had hoped would not happen, right, which is, which is continued Russian aggression uh, on the European continent, and now, of course, you, we find you know, Europe uh, a, a major war in Europe for the first time uh, since uh, since World War II. Uh, it's a terrible tragedy. Uh, we have been witnessing extraordinary valor on the part of the Ukrainians and terrible atrocities visited on the Ukrainian people uh, by by the Russians. And so, I'm just going to op ask an open-ended question, and everybody jump in here. It's a series of questions. You can take any part of it you want. What went wrong? Why, why was it, do you think, that we were unable to deter what's happening or what's happening since February 24th of last year uh, from occurring? What is your assessment? What are, what are the prospects for peace now? Uh, and, and how do you envision the war evolving? And what more can we do right, to, to support the Ukrainian people and to restore peace on terms that are acceptable to the victims uh, in this war, the Ukrainians? So, I know that's a big that's a big question series of questions, but but uh, this is something I know that that um, that our viewers would love to hear your perspectives on. Um, I have not the <laughs> I have no real answer to your questions, HR. Uh, the past, the question of the past, and the question of the future. The question of the past is um, the subject of a, a debate uh, uh, in France, and uh, there are people who say. Also, in your countries, uh, even in the US, I think I, I read some of them, uh, some some of their papers. We think that we we have not done 
what we should have done in our relations with, with Russia. But this is a question, this is a, a question for historians now. What we can absolutely affirm, including through uh, the visit paid by President Macron to Moscow just before the start of the war, is that we have made our proposals for the security of Europe. And it stays for the future. But what I wanted to answer, uh, what I wanted to say, Cha, is that we have also to see what we have achieved after the invasion more than one year ago. We have achieved two things which are really important and which we have to keep the unity among our countries and the mobilization of the international community based on this unity is something which was really important and probably uh, Putin uh, was uh, hoping not to see this unity. This has to be kept. We see the challenges in our democracies, including in the United States, uh, uh, but uh, also in our European countries. And the other thing we have achieved on the European side is an incredible transformation of uh, our uh, um, countries. Um, and uh, uh, frankly, this also was really uh, not obvious at all. Uh, the immediate reaction we, we had as Europeans together with the Americans, but also the fact that we have, especially as a European Union, but I, I am sure that the UK, <laughs> Mark would speak for the United Kingdom, which had a such also a strong reaction to help the Ukrainians. But we have, as a European Union, reacted uh, on three levels, which were really uh, not easy ones. Uh, first, uh, the defense and the fact that we, we have uh, started immediately new instruments uh, uh, to, to buy weapons and to support the Ukra Ukrainians. The second element is energy. We, we have uh, really um, developed our, uh, with the help of the United States, but also based mostly on uh, your, our decisions with a, a lot of sacrifices. Uh, we have uh, really increased our independence from Russian imports of oil and gas very, very rapidly. And, and third, what I would call the, economy, the resilience of our economies, also to support Ukraine, but also to support our economies, uh, which was absolutely not easy and which was also the consequence what we have learned from the COVID, uh, the pandemic uh, time. So. On these three levels, uh, we have seen a very strong, a very united reaction, which is now the thing which we, we must preserve. Finally, I will just add that uh, uh, for the future, it is really important to, to, to not to give the impression, especially in the international community, that we are the party of war. The war was started by Russia, everybody knows it, but it must be repeated and repeated that this invasion has violated all principles of international security of the Charter of the United Nations, and also that we, on our side, our nations, are ready at any point to support Ukraine to reach a peaceful, a peace settlement, and to restore at a point which obviously is not yet there, the uh, an order of security on the European continent, where we have our contribution, we have our ideas, and who are ready to give these ideas further. I think Philippe is absolutely right. I think, in a sense, the answer to the past and the answer to the future are quite similar, and and we need to learn from why. As you said in the beginning, HR, we weren't able to deter this and we weren't able to deter it partly because we didn't present a sufficiently robust and resilient um, united front against Russian uh, and indeed other aggression in the past. You can point at Iraq, you can point at the withdrawal from Afghanistan, but clearly Putin believed that we would not respond in the way that we did and that, and that Western countries would not stand together in the way that Philippe has, uh, has just described. And indeed, he underestimated our ability to transition away from the dependence on Russian energy uh, and so on um, that, that he had assumed gave him a trump card. And I think Philippe has described that, uh, described that really well. Um, uh, who knows exactly how this war will uh, progress, but uh, if it does stabilize at some point, whether there's a formal peace settlement or some kind of ceasefire with a line of control, whatever it whatever it is, it's critically important we don't make the same mistakes again, that we really ensure that any pause is not an opportunity for Putin simply to regroup, hope, hope our attention is diverted, particularly American attention, diverted by the challenges in the Pacific and then 
go again at some point in the future. Uh, and make sure that Ukraine is equipped with the capabilities that they will need, that Philippe described, that they will need in order to defend and therefore deter against further Russian aggression um, in the future. So that means really continuing to lean into Ukraine's um, uh, social and economic reconstruction, but in particular uh, to upgrade their defense uh, capabilities with the kinds of weapons that uh, they, they believe they need now to to deal with the Russian aggression, but they will certainly need in the future to defend and deter uh, against it again. And then we've just got to, you know, we've then just got to remain solid. And as we did, as Philippe described, as we did over the use of chemical weapons in Syria back in 2018, as we saw after the Salisbury attack uh, uh, the same year, uh, demonstrate that we won't be divided and that we will respond firmly to acts of aggression. And that's the best way of deterring them whether in the European hemisphere or indeed uh, elsewhere in the world in the next decade or so. I can only agree to what Mark said, oh, not, much, um, not much to add, only um, to say that um, we are still, we haven't, um, we are not there yet. I think Putin still believes he can win this war. He still believes that um, you know, Ukrainians uh, at some stage uh, will, um, no longer sustain all the efforts and he of course counts on us Europeans, counts on the Americans um, to be affected soon by a Ukraine fatigue and there I think also HR it's very important that um, the signals from DeSantis and other Republicans uh, um, you know that, that they don't uh, get um, you know a majority in your country so we still have to to fight um, you know to see that we can that we can sustain the efforts this also holds true for 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 my country um, and um, um, we cannot um, actually count on on Putin to be a real partner in the future uh, um, to have the arrest warrant out um, um, some people um, who like realpolitik will hate it, but I think that it's a very strong signal that this guy is an outcast and uh, we have given him so many opportunities in the past. He all, um, uh, um, he all, he never took any of them to become a partner, but he chose the, the aggression, he chose confrontation, and I think he has to pay the price for um, the, the millions of people that have been affected by, by this. So my concern is, um, do we have um, the power to uh, the energy, the persistence to, to sustain the effort? And this is what we have to do. And, and then at some stage, indeed, um, as Mark said, we have to arm the Ukrainians. I wouldn't be against even then now getting NATO membership. Um, but I don't see that we get um, uh, probably common ground for this in NATO. So the alternative is to put them full of full of weapons. I, I completely agree with uh, uh, what what the friends have said before. My may, maybe my point, and this is a point that uh, maybe Christophe did at, uh, at one uh, moment in his uh, reflection, is really how do we continue to get our public opinion behind us and and there is a role there for for politics for for really uh, our internal politics to uh to to play um so what i think is that uh putin uh thinks that time is in his it plays in his uh, in his advantage um and and so right now the, the biggest challenge that I see is really uh, how do we keep our public opinion behind us in, in what we are doing? How do we sustain um, the convictions that we have that the condition for any negotiation have to be just? that the only peace that is possible is a just peace based on the UN Charter principles. How, how do we um, continue convincing our public opinion that the sacrifices that we have uh, demanded uh, in many different ways um, are, are, are so important? How basically Ukraine independence and sovereignty and, and rights to be a, a free uh, democracy 
uh, in the end are the same rights that we defend every day in our own democracies. Uh, I think there is a big role to, to be played there. We are in a war of attrition, uh, which means that the only way to, uh, I think that the only choice that we have is to continue to sustain Ukraine, uh, not to lose the, 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 way, the, the war of attrition, uh, but all these as, um, um, uh, presents big challenges. And also, I think uh, we will see much more um, asymmetric threats. We will see uh, attempt of destabilization of other countries. And I'm thinking of Moldova, for instance. Uh, we will see more uh, cyber attack on our critical infrastructures. Um, so we have to be prepared also for something that could come um, the Bulgarian election coming up as well, I would add. Well, yes, uh, I make a distinction there between a European Union country and, and maybe others that are less, um, uh, how can I say, that have less means to, to defend their own democracies. Uh, and, and I'm not doing a first class, second class uh, sort of classification is that is is just that the European Union provides um, a, a safer, if you want, uh, framework. But so what I see is more challenge coming, and and um, and how to keep uh, our public opinions uh, really behind uh, the just policies that we are putting in place. And and of course I'm. Uh, I live in your country, I char, I see the debate every day and every day it becomes more and more difficult, precisely also in the perspective of, of the election in, uh, in uh, less than two years. Well, Mary Angela and, and all of you, I really agree that this is a contest of wills and, and maintaining our will is immensely important. And I think what Philippe began with is it's immensely important for us to really place blame where it belongs and knock down some of these narratives that you know, that that uh, somehow we failed to give Putin the security, you know, assurances that he needed that might have prevented the war. Of course, he has aspirations that go far beyond anything in reaction to what we do, you know, and, and I think we've seen that we've seen that play out. I think the lessons that all of you have highlighted are immensely important and they apply to another competition that I think we're probably going to have to almost end with because we're, we're running out of time, which is the competition with China. I think, you know, I think we learned as, as all of us have been discussing that you know, really peace is best preserved through strength. Strength, uh, you know, as as really capability, you know, hard capability, uh, but but also, you know, but but also uh, the perception of will. And I believe that what, you know, Christophe, I think identified as the disaster in Afghanistan, other, you know, other indicators of weakness on our part. I think maybe the stop, the stoplight coalition in Germany, you know, the, the contested election, uh, in France, you know, the, the the trouble that Boris Johnson was, I mean, I think there, these were all, I think, perceptions that Putin had all, you know, the West, you know, uh, you know Europe, the United States, they're, they're done, right? And, and of course, Xi Jinping is now visiting uh, is Putin. And I think it's important to recall, you know, their meeting in Beijing just prior to the Olympics, where they sort of declared Europe and, and the transatlantic relationship and the West broadly as over, in this new era of international relations in which they were going to be in charge, right? And they uh, they voiced their concerns about so-called color revolutions, but 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 also, you know, also made it clear uh, that they were determined, you know, to, to create, I think, a preponderance of power and influence in the world. Well, things maybe aren't going that well for them. I guess the question is, you know, what more do we need to do to compete with what it seems are two revanchist, powers on the Eurasian landmass uh, who are determined to pursue their interests at our expense. Uh, what have you seen in terms of the trajectory, in terms of um, European and, and, uh, and, and American perceptions of the threat from China? And what are your ideas about how we can compete more effectively uh, with what the European Union has now called you know, a systemic rival in the, in the form of, of the Chinese Communist Party? HR, I think just listening to you, I was really, it reminded me of a comment that Jens Stoltenberg made about China. This was well, a couple of years ago now when he said, well, NATO may not be in their hemisphere, but they're in ours. And the, the fact that in the modern era, um, that global security, the world economy, the, 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 the global environment, we, we can't really talk uh, sensibly about 
different theatres or different hemispheres anymore because most of these challenges are now are now global. I agree with you. I think um, uh, President Xi's visit to Moscow is is essentially sick. It's really not about Russia and Ukraine. It's about the Chinese relationship with the United States and signalling to Washington that he is going to double down on his partnership uh, with Russia for the reasons that we have discussed. And actually, I think um, strategically, what the United States has been doing in the past year or so is absolutely the right course, um, strengthening uh, alliances not only in Europe, but in the Pacific. So we've seen Japan uh, increasing their defence expenditure and Japan and India beginning to work more effectively uh, together. New bases in the Philippines, the AUKUS uh, agreement and so on. And just gradually weaving together these alliances of like-minded countries, not because we're seeking to encircle or contain China, uh, as they would uh, suggest, but because those countries feel threatened by China's expansionist uh, behavior, at least under uh, under this president. And so that kind of um, uh, uh, allied resilience, building building that is a is a crucial part of uh, of how we must uh, contest this. As you also said, of course, it's about will, um, but it's also about having faith in our own model. Uh, you in you, the, the G7 uh, still represents over half the world economy. If you think of it as as essentially being the two big continental uh, economies, the United States and the European Union, plus the biggest independent advanced economies, Japan, the UK and Canada, add in Australia and South Korea, very like-minded nations, you're at half the world economy still. And so if we can really work more effectively together, lower trade barriers between each other, not use national security provisions in trade and investment legislation against our allies, you know, all of these kinds of things and really work together and double down on our own model, then uh, we can definitely uh, we can definitely prevail, because one thing that one dilemma China has not yet wrestled with for all the extraordinary economic progress they've made is if you prioritise control over growth, that is what you'll get, and it's quite clear right now that's what they're prioritising, and therefore we do have the opportunity to show that our model of democratic market systems. Um, is uh, the right is, is the right approach. It worked for Ronald Reagan and uh, the leaders of that era, and it'll work again in this era if we just have confidence in it. And by the way, it will help as well in our engagement with those other countries who are currently inclined to non-alignment to see that uh, there's an opportunity to follow uh, our model. No one wants a green card for Beijing or Moscow. You know, they want green cards for. Um, the United States and, and Europe. And uh, we must remember that underlying attraction of our model. Well, I think that uh, to answer your question, uh, as uh, Mark said, determination uh, to, to act according our, to our uh, to what we believe is the most important, is really important, determination and, and, and unity. Uh, and then, uh, uh, of course, uh, also, um, uh, uh, and by determination, I, I mean um, not only uh, the increase of our um, capacities to defend our interests, in, including militarily, what we, we unfortunately we have to do, what we are doing, but also the determination to handle our Real, real dependencies and to increase the resilience of our technologies and our economies. But while we are doing this, and as the US is doing it, but also Europe, we have, and it is a second condition, to do it in a coordinated way. This is the whole discussion we had in Europe about the Inflation Reduction Act or the Chips and Science Act voted by the Congress last summer, which are really uh, good uh, legislations in terms of strategic goals. But the second condition is that we have to coordinate, as, as Mark said, uh, in a way which does not impede us, our collective effort to be efficient. And the third thing, and excuse me to come back to this, is again, and you said, HR, we don't ask the, the other countries to choose. And this is a really important point. I remember once visiting an African country um, 
um, in Eastern Africa with uh, President Macron and the, the head of state said, you don't ask somebody to uh, choose between eating an apple and eating an orange. He wants, I want to have both of them. Okay, but as Mark said, we have to uh, document to, to showcase the fact that what we propose is really uh, both in terms of organization of the multinational, multilateral system, but also uh, in terms, and, and I mean here, fairness of this international system, the fact that every country has a voice, but also in terms of advantages, uh, uh, positive uh, results for the our, our, our interlocutors, we, we have to propose things which uh, uh, for African countries, for Pacific Island states, uh, which meet their basic needs. And here, things like uh, biodiversity, climate, we didn't discuss those global challenges, they're really important. We have to be both engaging China and others, but uh, including China, but also to propose the solutions uh, to uh, other countries. So China is this um, systemic challenge uh, and, and is meant to, to stay there. So I think we, as, as the other said, we must address it through um, reinforcing our cooperation among allies. Um, at the same time, we have continue, we have to continue to engage Beijing um, in what I call dialogue. I don't know if it's the, the right word, but I think it is. We, we, we are still open to dialogue, right? Uh, as much as possible. But uh, why? In order to identify those incentives um, to collaborate, and to preserve um, at the same time all the necessary guardrails, the where this systemic competition is going to, to happen, how. And in that respect, there are two things that I want to say. One, I think Philippe um, sort of um, referred to that. When we talk about our security, our strategic security, we have to think in terms of our economic security and i think we maybe we have to uh, to do a a bigger effort to to be much more coordinated also on that because from that uh, you know we have to be strong on the economic uh, security of, of our like-minded uh, community and the other thing we have to be quick also i have the impression sometimes that um of course, we have our principle and these are our guides, but at the same time, we need to be quick. There are situations that are really a calling for action. Right now, I'm thinking about Tunisia, for instance, uh, and, and, and the country that is now the famous only uh, uh, Arab Spring, successful, et cetera, et cetera. We have to be quick because this country is there in, a, you know, uh, and, and who's going to step in? in in our absence, others. That's 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 clear to, to me. So uh, this systemic competition, we have to play it in a way that is not a decoupling. I don't think we need to go in that direction. I think it would be extremely detrimental also to, to go in that direction. But we have to be strong, keep dialogue open, be very much uh, much more um, linked on the economic security of our, of our uh, countries and at the same time be quick in reacting to a, a crisis situation, not to be the second or the third or arrive too late when others are already there. And I think if you look at Northern Africa, uh, the Sahel, this is one of the things that we couldn't do uh, HR altogether, understanding how big was the threat there that others were taking our 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 space um or the space that we we didn't occupy and right now i'm thinking of russia and wagner and uh, and terrorism and i come back to i think what what philippe was saying um 
the terrorist threat. I agree with Maria Angela what she just said. I think we we must not be naive. Um, quite the contrary, we know that China wants a different world order, um, and um, um, we we just have to be. Um, uh, we must not be naive about this. On the other hand, um, it doesn't help if we are now, um, um, and this goes a bit into your direction, HR, if we are you know, doubling down on China and um, um, you know, upstaging Taiwan, visiting and supporting, etc., because this will only then lead to the um, an escalation where nobody nobody can win. So without any illusions about China, we still have to be careful careful in how we deal. We have to be practical, and I think uh, Tunisia is such an example. Why were we not able to um, actually support the country when they had their old president and somehow um, you know, this was going in the right direction? And now we see all the, the negative, um, negative turns there. I don't know, Marianne, if it's too late with regard to Tunisia, and we have to analyze this. My conclusion on this is in these countries, we, um, when we engage, we have to do it much more forceful, much with much more um, instruments at our disposal, just to um, you know give a few scholarships and give uh, you know some consultants and do some exchange programs, offer a few jobs. It's not enough. We have to invest. They wanted to have a university there. We said, well, we don't have the means and uh, there's no need. But maybe if we had done that, really invested massively in the country, and this you can only do. And that would be my concluding mark a bit um, turn to my own country, but maybe you have a similar situation in your countries. We have to get the different actors that we have in our countries. Ministry for Development, Foreign Ministry, Ministry of Trade, private industry, um, big funds, pension funds, etc. We have to combine that um, so that we can put big infrastructure projects in there as the Chinese can do, where everything is decided by the by the Communist Party, basically. So we have also to restructure maybe the way how we deal the, with these countries in Africa and other other continents, so that we can really, on substance, provide something that until now we cannot do. Well, I think all of you made a really strong uh, case for for engagement and in recognition that that difficulties and challenges and problems that develop abroad can only be dealt with at an exorbitant cost once they reach our shores and, and hit home as they had have with the, with the war in Ukraine. I think you've all made a great case for, you know, for peace through strength and, and really collective action to share burdens and to be more effective across our, our alliances and, and with like-minded partners. So I, I can't thank you enough. What I want to do is do a quick speed round and go and ask each of you to just provide some some closing thoughts to our to our viewers. Well, uh, interesting conversation. I think I think we have also to we, we didn't talk about many challenges. And I when I when I think of um, food security, uh, water, energy, um, climate change, migration. All these are huge challenges that are totally interrelated with the, the major crisis that we have addressed today and, and in our work together in the past. Um, I think we have to, to really uh, focus much more on these big, big, big challenges, global. Uh, and there, um, there is space, and, and I, I, I want to believe that we still have space for international cooperation. And this is my, my, my heart as previous uh, Italian representative to the UN. I still believe in, in a global response to global challenges. And, and uh, I, I, I really want to believe that this is um, still possible. Well, HR, thank you again for getting us together. It's been great to uh, be with everyone in all too brief a conversation, and let's hope we can do it um, over dinner or um, uh, in another in another more congenial way than even than even than uh, this. I agree with Marianne. I think the the we have to remember that the really big challenges of the twenty first century are the ones that she set out. Those huge uh, environmental, socio economic challenges. On that. We mustn't just cooperate with ourselves, we must engage, including with 
uh, with China. We, we, we mustn't um, assume that a second Cold War in this century is inevitable. It is, it is still possible to establish a stable relationship with China to revive some of the concepts of the later Cold War, detente of peaceful coexistence and so on, which recognize that we have very severe differences and we can only navigate those through unity and strength, but that there are areas on which we must cooperate and in particular climate change and the other big environmental challenges. And, and we can then navigate our way safely through the 21st century, recognizing that there are some very big and important countries that have different, different and competing political systems to ours. So as Christoph said earlier, we shouldn't be seeking to decouple. Uh, there are some areas of our economies, of course, where we need to disentangle them, you know, areas of tech and defense and so on, you know, obviously those. But we mustn't decouple entirely because in the end, we need to be able to work together. And if we're unified among ourselves, then we can also uh, present a unified uh, front and find areas in which we can cooperate with countries like China that you know, otherwise will be uh, competitors. Uh, and, and it's in navigating that very complex balance that's going to be the, ch the, the, the challenge for diplomats um, in the next quarter of, the, of this uh, 21st century. I want to make a slightly different point. My analysis is that we are strong um, and we um, um, have to continue to cooperate, but it's not enough uh, that we do it. I think that um, one of the tasks we have in our societies is that we make our countries that we participate as, um, um, you know, um, as people who belong to UK, France, Italy, US, Germany, that we also um, help to have our democracies function. Um, I think we have a challenge there in all of our countries and um, we need to participate in um, making um, um, our uh, co-citizens aware of um, what is happening around us um, have our countries appreciate um, the freedoms that they enjoy, uh, the needs to reform our countries. And what we need is that we have in our countries enough people ready to engage in public service, ready to engage in politics, um, and to, to speak out and defend our, our domestic orders. Because if we are as our as societies um, of all countries, if we are not, not successful, if we don't resolve problems, we'll have more situations where it is, um, you know, that China and Russia and, and other authoritarian countries in this globe that will uh, become more and more dominant and solve um, uh, and be a more important players in other continents. So we also have to do our homework in our countries. Thank you so much, Echa, for me gathering us. And I, I like this quint format, and I look forward to meeting in person all of you in Villa Firenze in Washington, or maybe in Stanford, <laughs> uh, or wherever. I agree with everything which uh, uh, Mariangela, Mark, and uh, Christoph said. We we must. Uh, in a, in, a, in a very, very close cooperation among our nations, we must not underestimate our strength, our collective strengths, but we must also understand there is, this is a new world and uh, our model uh, will um, uh, prevail, I'm sure, uh, but there are conditions for that. The first condition is what uh, Christoph said, that we reinforce our own democracies uh, and uh, societies and, uh, and economies, uh, but also um, the second uh, important uh, collective task should be, uh, I think, to show uh, to all nations in the world that we are um, uh, facing some uh, revisionist attempts, we are not, uh, the ones who want absolutely to keep everything as it is. On the contrary, we are ready together to improve the international system, to give every nation uh, more chances, not only for a prosperity but also and freedom, but also for securing its own sovereignty in terms of freedom of choice for uh, what every nation uh, wants to do. So I think we have the best opportunities to do that 
uh, if we are united and also if we each of us strong enough to do for doing this. Thank you again for this uh, opportunity. Well, Philippe, Mariangela, Christophe, Mark, thank you for helping us celebrate the 50th episode of Battlegrounds, but thanks especially for your for your friendship and, and your service to your nations, to our alliance, and, and really all humanity. On behalf of the Hoover Institution and our audience, thank you for helping us learn more about Battlegrounds important to building a future of peace and prosperity for generations to come. It's wonderful to be back with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.